testimony. Uh, it appears that she's been offered to give testimony regarding her sexual orientation, her experiences with discrimination, the effects of being denied the right to marry, and the importance to her and her family of ultimately being able to marry. The relevance of this testimony is very unclear in that she's not a plaintiff in this case, she's not an expert in this case, and her particular experiences as one person certainly is not as we've been talking about, a reliable sample of these issues. So her testimony, as described here, has no probative value to the facts at issue in this case. And if counsel would like to clarify, that would be fine. Also, on top of that, they've identified a host of documents that will be used in connection with Ms. Zia that are of the same nature as um, we saw with Dr. Chauncey, involving, some involving Dr. Tam and otherwise... Uh, appearing to be directed to uh, the Chinese-American community. None of that was disclosed, uh, and we've been given no indication of what the relevance that is uh, in this case. Uh, Who's going to address that? Uh, I will address that, Your Honor. And you are? Uh, Danny Chu uh, Chu from the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. Um, her Her testimony is highly relevant. It is illustrative of much of the expert testimony that has come out. She's also an exemplified some of the city's harm, showing the differences between how domestic partnership is treated versus marriage and how marriage will generate far more revenue than domestic partnerships. Uh, with respect to the description um, of her testimony, uh, first of all, um, with respect to the documents on the messaging, these are all messages that she saw during the campaign for Proposition 8. These are examples of instances of discrimination that she experienced as a lesbian in California, and those are all clearly covered by the description of her testimony that we presented to the, point, to, the def- to the defendant interveners. Your Honor, I would take issue with that description being consistent with what was just represented, but to the extent that this testimony is um, consistent with the expert testimony and the prior testimony, it would certainly be uh, needlessly cumulative. We've had Four experts testify as to history of discrimination, the distinction between domestic partnership and civil marriage, including the four plaintiffs. For one person taken in, in what is in reality off the street to testify in this case as to her particular experience with those things, it's not relevant because she can't speak as an expert. She hasn't been designated as such. Her opinion in regard to those things is also not probative of a fact in this case. And that's the standard for her testimony. It has to be make a fact in this case either more likely or less likely. Her experience with discrimination or uh, same-sex marriage is not probative of any fact in this case. Your Honor, if I could address that in addition, the other important aspect of Ms. Dia's testimony is she's actually gotten married. And this whole case is about how marriage is going to change things for same-sex couples and enhance their relationships and enhance their relationships with their families. Here she is a real-life example of that, and everything else has sort of been theory. And what she is is she demonstrates, in fact, that marriage does change things for people, and it's very important to same-sex couples, and it does indeed have a transformative effect. And that there's nothing about that else in this case. And this bookends the plaintiffs who are telling you that they want to get married, and these are the reasons why. Well, she's an exact example of what they are looking for. And in that respect, she has an incredible amount of probative value to this case. You're right. Not to belabor the point. That kind of evidence is the kind of evidence that is demonstrated through scientific and expert testimony. If the city would like to demonstrate that, then they should present a study with a reliable sample size of individuals that have experienced the things that Ms. Zia has experienced. One single solitary individual to get up on the stand and to testify to her experiences can't possibly demonstrate what the experience of all same couples, same sex couples has been. It's not scientifically reliable. It's completely inappropriate in this context. Uh, if I could just add one thing. Submit it. Sorry. Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> a little too anxious, I apologize. <laughs> Experience counts. <laughs> Thank you, David. 
One of the advantages of a bench trial is that evidence can be heard, its relevance and its weight can be considered and determined as the evidence is presented, and uh, counsel for the defendant interveners has made arguments that the evidence that the witness is going to present is not relevant or of little weight. Now, that is certainly something that can be considered after the court has uh, if heard the evidence and evaluated it. It does appear from counsel's, uh, plaintiff's counsel's representation that uh, the witness is going to speak to issues that have been raised in the case and which uh, are important for the ultimate resolution of the issues here. So uh, I will permit the witness to testify and make a final evaluation with respect to how much weight to give, that, give to that testimony and how to uh, weigh it in the entire case uh, as we go along. But it does appear that uh, she's being offered on subjects that are pertinent to the overall issues in the litigation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Dia. Uh, let's begin by uh, having you tell the court a little bit about yourself. Um, how old are you, Ms. Dia? I'm 57 years old. Uh, where did you grow up? In New Jersey. Uh, how long have you lived in California? Sure, Counsel, you keep your voice up and the witness. Sure. Uh, how long have you lived in California? For about 18 years. Um, how many siblings do you have? I have five siblings. Uh, are any of them married? Uh, four of them are. Um, are your parents still alive? My mother is still living. And uh, where does your mom live? My mom lives in the Bay Area. Where did you go to school? I went to high school at John F. Kennedy High School in New Jersey. And um, I went to college at Princeton University. Uh, did you graduate? Yes, I did. And uh, what degree did you earn? A bachelor's of arts degree. And uh, do you have any other degrees? I have an honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Um, from where? From the City University of New York School of Law. And uh, what do you do? I'm a writer. Uh, have you written any books? I've written two and two books, and I've edited uh, a number of publications. Um, can you briefly tell us a little bit about the two books that you've written? My first book is called um, Asian American Dreams: The Emergence of an American People. And it's a book about the um, contemporary history of Asian Asian Americans, and, uh, particularly around civil rights matters and um, struggles, uh, trials and tribulations over the last, I'd say, um, 40 years. And your second book? My second book was about uh, was uh, entitled "My Country Versus Me." and was the story of the Chinese-American scientist at Los Alamos National Labs, uh, whose name is Wen Ho Li, who was falsely accused of being a spy for the People's Republic of China. And I co-authored that with him to tell his story. Um, have you ever worked for any publications? I've worked for a number of publications. Uh, what was the last publication that you worked for? Uh, the last one was Ms. Magazine. And uh, what was your position? When I left, I was executive editor. Um, Ms. Sia, are you a lesbian? I am. Um, how long have you been a lesbian? I think I've been a lesbian all my life. And uh, when did you come out? Coming out is uh, a process. And so there are a lot of ways to describe what coming out is. Um, I think I first became aware that I was a lesbian when I was, um, or that I might be a lesbian when I was uh, in college, when I first learned the word lesbian. But there were a lot of um, experiences I had when I was younger, starting when I was even about six or seven years old, that I, I look back now and realize that they were uh, clear signs of that, that I, what team I was on. Give an example. <laughs> Can you give an example of one of those experiences when you were very young? Well, when I was about 
six or seven or eight. Um, I was just a school kid. I was, you know, maybe I was in school and there was a neighbor lady or a couple of adults around who typically ask kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she asked me, so do you want to get married when you grow up? In the kind of tone that I would, that the expectation was the answer should be yes. And I was just a kid, but I immediately said, no, I don't want to get married. And I remember this because she was really surprised that, you know, here I was a little girl and I, you know, was so um, definite and emphatic that I didn't want to get married. And it was very clear to me, even at that time, that I really couldn't imagine getting married, married to a man. It just was not in my, um, in my worldview or imagination. And you mentioned that you were first aware that you might be a lesbian when you were in college. When did you actually come out? Well, I guess the clearest way to say that is I, uh, I had my first relationship with a woman um, in the mid-1980s when I was in my 30s. How much after that was uh, when you were in college? That would have been about 12 years, 10, 12 years after college. Why did it take so long between college and your first relationship with a woman? There were many, I guess I would say, social pressures uh, to to um, to steer me away from the person I really was. To um, for me not to be a lesbian. Give me an example. Well, um, I actually had a, an incident that I think of as a, a lesbian trial where um, after I left college, I had uh, for a time attended medical school. And I quit medical school and uh, realized that I wanted to spend more of my time in doing community organizing, like our president. and. So I um, was involved in my neighborhood in Boston doing a lot of uh, community work, community organizing work in this particular time around um, uh, ending discrimination in the construction trades for federally funded projects, which at that time didn't hire women, they didn't hire people of color at all. They were very restrictive but very high paying jobs. and. Um, so I was involved with a lot of people in my neighborhood, community groups, especially an Asian, uh, uh, an Asian community organization and, and, and an African American community organization. We were working together to do this kind of um, um, anti-discrimination work. And one day I was called to a meeting and I didn't know the purpose of the meeting except that there was a meeting. And when I got to the meeting, there was a group of people, all my friends, all these people in these community groups that I looked at as my family, my community. We worked hard together with each other for, for these causes and they told they were sitting in a semicircle and they asked me to sit down in the middle of the circle. And at the, at the time when I was doing this community work, I was also involved in a lot of women's organizing. There was a very active women's movement in Boston as well, and I was uh, involved in that. And so they called me to the meeting, knowing that I did this work in the women's movement, you know, and, and they said, so sit here. We want to ask you some questions. We've noticed that you seem to be working with a lot of women, and you seem to be working with a lot of lesbians. And you know, in our communities of color, the Asian American community, there um, we don't have uh, homosexuals in our community um, and it would be really terrible to have somebody who was uh, a homosexual, a lesbian, working with us because it would, uh, uh, because homosexuality is a symptom of white, of, of white petty bourgeois, um, uh, petty bourgeois decadence. And so we really wouldn't want to have you 
with us, working with us on these causes, if you are a lesbian. And the African American, um, the leader of the African American group said very similar things, that, that homosexuality is not something that uh, they could accept in the African American community. And after they laid out these things, as I sat in front of my friends and my, you know, my community, people I considered my extended family, um, they, they laid that out and then they said, so Helen, tell us, are you a lesbian? And I was, uh, I was about 23 then, and I sat there looking at the people that I trusted in this world asking me that, and I had friends who were indeed lesbians. And I didn't know at first how to answer that question. It was, are you a lesbian? What would make me a lesbian? I knew that I had had lesbian thoughts, whatever those are, that I had had attractions to women, but I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a membership card that said I was a lesbian. I didn't get a toaster oven or a congratulatory <laughs> message saying, welcome to lesbianhood. And um, so, but there they were, all staring at me, these people I trusted, and Helen, are you a lesbian? So I said, no, I'm not. And that made them happy. And for me, it was, it was, that was the end for them. The meeting disbanded, the trial was over. And for me, it was that I had stepped into the closet and slammed the door shut. Else in response to the lesbian trial? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, did you do anything else in response to the lesbian trial? You mentioned that you stepped in the closet and slammed the door. Is there anything specific that you did? Well, I got the message very clearly that, that they thought I might be a lesbian and that um, doing work in, with the women in the women's movement and having friends who were uh, lesbians was something that was unacceptable. And so having said that I was not a lesbian and stepping right into the closet, I stopped seeing my friends. I cut off all my ties with um, my dear friends in the women's movement there in Boston. I stopped going to meetings. I had been involved um, in a leadership capacity. I stopped completely. I really did shut the door. Um, did you also used to have diaries? Yes. Anything to those diaries after the lesbian trial? Um, I'm a writer today, but I think I started that a long time ago, even before I realized I would become a writer, and I was an avid journal keeper. I wrote diaries um, from the time that I was quite young. And after my lesbian trial, I, um, I knew that I had explored the thought, I had, had written down thoughts that maybe I'm a lesbian. I find so-and-so to be very attracted. I have these feelings. Um, and so shortly after the, this trial, I uh, was going to move. I was going to move from Boston to Detroit, and I was going to pack up my little car with all my small number of worldly possessions, and then there came a question of what do I do with these diaries? And I was, I became so concerned that what if I was driving on the highway and I got into a car accident and was killed, and there are my diaries that say I think I might be a lesbian. I took my diaries, which at that time was probably more than 10 years worth of diaries, and I um, went out to a field nearby, a construction site where there was a barrel. I put them in and I lit them up and I burned my diaries. Yeah. Have you ever experienced any discrimination relating to your work due to your sexual orientation? Related to my work? Yes. Um, yes, on a few occasions. Provide an example? Well, there was a, a, a time when I um, was invited to give a speech. Uh, I do some lecturing and I was invited to give a speech uh, to Notre Dame University. And it was in the 1990s, the early 1990s, uh, when there was a lot of um, anti-gay campaigns going on. And the person who invited me was aware that I was a lesbian. And so one day after I got the invitation that she had extended to me, she asked me, um, and oh, by the way, are you going to say anything about 
sexual orientation or about being a lesbian. And I hadn't really thought much about what I was going to say yet, but I said, well, I'm not sure, but now that you've asked me, I, I might. And she said, well, in that case, um, I don't think you should come. And she uh, rescinded the invitation. So that was one incident. Um, have you ever experienced any discrimination from family members due to your sexual orientation? Yes, I have. When um, when I came out to, well, when I was delivering a lecture in, uh, in the New York area, I have a, a cousin out there, and he was very interested in the books I had written. He was very interested in uh, hearing my lecture. He came to my lecture, and in my lecture I talked about um, being a lesbian. I talked about uh, the discrimination that's faced um, by people of color, by lesbians, and the fact that I that I was a lesbian, and it was a very small part of my uh, my lecture, but after that he uh, completely cut off all ties. I had even made attempts to contact him when I was going to be uh, visiting New York, but he uh, had never has never returned a single phone call or message since then. Um, Missia, do you ever feel physically threatened because of your sexual orientation? I feel constantly aware that my sexual orientation could, uh, for whatever reason, provoke uh, violence toward me or toward my loved ones. Um, and so I do feel that I, uh, as I walk through life, as I go through the streets of, of San Francisco or anywhere else, especially when I am with my, my wife, um, that we, I feel very aware of, of whether we express our um, affection toward each other publicly, have any public displays of affection, whether we hold hands in public, where, we, where that might be. And my spouse is very affectionate. There are often times if we go to the movies or we go have dinner, like any other committed married couple, there might be a time where you'd want to put your arm around the other and just hold each other, hug each other. And, and Leah is very inclined to do that. And I feel that there are a lot of times when I have to, I, I do actually push her away and say, look where we are. Um, we have to be careful. And even within our own neighborhood, I feel alert. And I feel, and I feel bad about that. But I feel very conscious that there are people who hate us and just for who we are and that we have to be careful about that. Estia, do you remember the Proposition 8 campaign? I do. Um, did you encounter any discrimination during that campaign? Yes, I did. Can you describe some? Well, I guess I would just begin with the very notion of a campaign that would uh, degrade and devalue the marriage that I have with my wife, the most important person in my life, and to see the um, the ads and the misinformation and the deceptive kind of things that are said about us, I I would say that I I feel that that's highly discriminatory to um, to have to read or um, experience people saying to me, coming up to me, and uh, uh, making slurs, calling me names telling me that I'm an abomination, that my marriage to Leah and uh, uh, other people like us, uh, um, people have said when we were working on the, on the Prop 8 campaign, the uh, effort to, um, uh, we had worked on the campaign to, to um, uh, try to get people to vote no on Proposition 8. And when we would be out in, on the streets of San Francisco or in Oakland, um, handing out flyers, people would just come up to us and say, you're, you know, uh, you're a you dyke, you, and excuse my language, Your Honor, but you fucking dyke, or um, you're going to die and burn in hell, or you're an abomination. And to read the um, materials and to see the kind of uh, uh, things that have been put out there about us, like um, our marriage 
our existence, my marriage to you, is going to cause people to uh, have sex with, with animals, to contribute to bestiality in society, or that my marriage to Leah is going to, I guess, cause them to marry other people so that there will be more polygamy in society, or that my marriage to Leah is going to cause great harm to their children and lead to the molestation of children, and that my marriage to Leah is going to cause the end of the human race. And while we were handing out flyers, dozens of people, separate people, in separate locations, separate times, in different cities, would look at the flyer, laugh, or just look at us or say something uh, with the, the most derisive kind of expression and say, no more people. With this, no more people. No more human race. That we, such abominations, would be... Uh, the cause of the end of the human race. And to me, that these were all highly discriminatory because in essence they're saying that we are so offensive, that we are so not worthy of being human beings, of having the full rights and equality that every other human being, heterosexual human being, can enjoy, to just be married to each other, that we would cause the end of the human race and if we were to cause all of these things, then we would be. What, what do you do when somebody is going to end the human race and cause great harm to your children and cause all of this terrible stuff? Well, you're going to want to stamp them out. And to me, that was a highly painful um, and discrimi discriminatory and hurtful message that I, I also felt endangered us. Um, as well. Um, Miss Zia, if you could turn to the binder in front of you, and uh, it's PX2199. Um, can you take a quick look at it? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, uh, we disclosed this exhibit on Wednesday, and we alerted them. Uh, it's now Friday. They've had it for 48 hours. Uh, I don't see any prejudice to this. They've had plenty of time to take a look at it and observe it. All right. Well, as long as it was disclosed prior to uh, the witness's testimony and in accordance with the standing order that we have in the case, so this will be fine. You may present the exhibit to the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, do you recognize this exhibit? I do. Uh, can you tell me what it is? It is... Uh one of the pages from a website called One Man, One Woman. When did you first see this page? I saw this website and this page uh, during the um, uh, Yes on Aid campaign. You can, you can take that up on cross-examination, Calvin. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, can you read the, uh, I guess, the first sentence in red? Homosexuality is homosexuality linked to pedophilia. Uh, then can you read the next sentence below that? Studies show that homosexuality is linked to pedophilia, and then there's a dot, 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 and more, a link to more of that. And you recently, just a few minutes ago, you described basically these types of messages that you found offensive and hurtful. Is this an example of one of those? Yes, this is an example of one of those. All right, I'd like to move this into evidence. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed the, the number of this document is, is uh, PX2199. There's any foundation for this document, as I've indicated a moment ago, it's not an official campaign document from protectmarriage.com. It's highly prejudicial if it's associated with, with the campaign as an official document and it should be excluded.
All right, you've made a 403 objection. I'll reserve until you're cross. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Gia, you've mentioned that you're married. Uh, what's your wife's name? Her name is Leah Shigemura. Were you married? Uh, I'm going to call her Leah. Um, had you been married before? Uh, no. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your how you feel about Leah? I feel that Leah is my soulmate in life. I love her. I she's the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. Um, She's the most important person to me. When did you first meet Leah? I first met Leah in 1983 here in San Francisco. I was uh, living in Detroit at the time. And we were both involved in a uh, civil rights campaign uh, that uh, revolved around the hate crime against a Chinese American man in Detroit named Vincent Chin. And I was in Detroit part of the um, part of that campaign and we came to San Francisco um, as part of the educational piece of that campaign and Leah was on the organizing committee here in San Francisco. Uh, when did you and Leah start dating? We didn't start dating until um, m many years after that, uh, about 1992. And when you started dating, uh, where were the two of you living? Leah was still here in San Francisco, and I was in New York at that time. And did you eventually decide to uh, get together in the same area? Yes. And I assume one of you moved? Yes, I moved out here. And uh, when you moved, uh, did you give anything up when you moved to San Francisco from New York? Um, well, I had been born and raised in New Jersey. I was... Uh, uh, an East Coast person, so I left the East Coast, but I was well in, in trenched, I guess I'd say, in my uh, journalism career. I was at News Magazine, I was executive editor, and I was um, in the succession to be the editor-in-chief of News Magazine at that time. And then I met Leah. And Ms. Magazine, the job I had was really the, the job I had always wanted. It was, it was where I wanted to be. But when I met Leah, I knew that this was the woman I wanted to be with. This was the person I wanted to be with for all my life. And, and um, so there was no real decision to make. I, I left New York, the East Coast, the home I had, but I, I left the job that I had always wanted. Um. Have you and Leah ever registered as domestic partners? Yes. Um, when did you first register as a domestic partner? Uh, we met. We registered um, as domestic partners first in the city of San Francisco in 1993, shortly after I moved here to be with Leah. Describe the process of registering for a domestic partner at that time. Yes, it was um, actually a little um, anticlimactic. We we're excited about being able to register as um, domestic partners. We came to City Hall. We went to a window that I would describe as a uh, kind of all-purpose postal window kind of thing where I think they issued dog licenses as well as domestic partner licenses. And how did that process make you feel? I left feeling a little like, so this is, this is domestic partnership. This was, uh, we walked away with a little certificate, the kind that a kid, the kind that a kid gets for uh, perfect attendance that week. And so it was just a, a little certificate that, you know, we still valued and we put in a frame, but it didn't feel like, uh, it didn't feel like much at all. It wasn't the kind of thing we sent notices out to friends about or, Sent invitations to uh, to a party or anything. So you didn't have any celebration. No, not at all. Um, did you ever? Did you later register as a domestic partner with the state of California? Yes, we did. When uh, uh, state domestic partnerships became available in, I guess, um, 2003, we we filed for uh, a domestic partnership again with the state. Can you describe that process? Please? Well, there was no dog license window this time. Instead, we downloaded the form from the Internet, filled it out, got it notarized, and mailed it in. 
and that was it. And did you get something back in the mail? We got another form back in the mail, and it said, you're now domestic partners in the state of California. And did you hold a celebration? No, not at all. It was getting that form in the mail was not uh, not an occasion to write home about. So um, you, mentioned, you mentioned that you were married. When did you first get married to Leah? We got married in 2004 during the President's Day, Valentine's Day weekend, the first moment that we could um, when marriages became available to same-sex couples. About how you decided to get married? Well, at first we weren't sure that what we were seeing in the news was real, and we talked to each other. We said, what? Look at this. Is this real? And we thought about it, about, okay, should we get married? But you're, we would want our family around with us if we were going to get married. Your dad is in Honolulu. He's pretty elderly. My mother is also quite elderly and thought, well, all those people have to stand for eight hours in the rain. I don't think we can subject our parents to this. And then I got a phone call from my mother who said, Helen, I saw on the news, couples can get married. You and Leah can get married now. Why don't you get married? And that was mom. And so that was like, oh, okay. And um, then there was just the, the logistical question about everything was happening so quickly. How would we, how would we manage this? We had friends um, who were working in the uh, city, the San Francisco City Assessor Recorder's Office, who were um, uh, actually in charge of getting the marriage licenses um, done, getting the process done. And they were looking for volunteers. They were looking for people to help process these thousands of, of couples who were applying to get married. And they asked us um, if we could volunteer. Leah and I both know how to type and file and do those kind of things. So, so we said, sure, we'll come in. We'll come in and, and help. So we came in on, um, on, I believe it was the Monday, President's Day, and it was a, a you know, a government holiday, but the um, office was kept open through the volunteers. And we went there and typed and filed for about, um, I think, about eight hours. The line was all the way around the block. And at the end of the day, after we had typed all these people, and I was in the process before Leah, so I was typing people's applications as they were coming in, and she was later on um, doing something else. And I was done. They had closed the line. It was almost, you know, 5 o'clock or whatever the time they were going to close. And so I looked at Leah, and I said, should I type out an application for us? Would you marry me? And Leah said, I can't talk now. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm still filing these people's things. Very responsible of her. <laughs> yeah, she was, took her responsibilities very seriously. And so while she was still processing uh, other couples to get married, I was there with the, you know, the word processor, and I filled out the form for us. I put in her name and put in all the information and put in my name and all of the information. And then I had the form and I took it over to her and I said, here's the marriage license. Would you marry me? And she said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so there we were probably one of the last couples of the whole day after everybody else had been processed. The people who had waited in line for eight hours were done. And then then we went ahead and uh, had witnesses and had a had a justice of the peace marriage ceremony. Did you celebrate at some point? We did. It was um, then after we had our marriage licenses and it was we're married. Well, okay. Um, then we started talking about like any other uh, couple. What kind of how are we going to celebrate this? And we decided we wanted to have a big wedding reception, a wedding reception like every other couple would have with a wedding banquet. We issued um, um, wedding invitations, had them printed up, you know, with all the little envelopes and things like that, 
uh, drew up a list, had all of the kind of discussions and even a few arguments about what <laughs> music are we going to play, you know, where will we go, how much are we going to spend, what date. We picked a date in August for our wedding party, and uh, August 20th and sent the invitations out to um, 150, 200 people and, uh, um, and did all the kind of things to prepare for a big wedding party. Um, how many people attended your wedding? About uh, uh, 150. And did your families attend? Our, our families, our wonderful, loving and supportive families came from all over the United States. So Leah grew up in 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 Hawaii in Honolulu. I grew up in the East Coast. So we actually had friends and family coming from the entire span of of America, from all the way to the from the East Coast to uh, Hawaii, flew in to come to our our um, our marriage, um, our wedding party, our wedding celebration, and we planned also to have a, an affirmation ceremony there. Leah's dad who at the time was um, at that time was 86 years old. Leah's dad was a retired judge in uh, in the state of Hawaii. So he came. He brought his uh, judge's robes, and he was going to uh, officiate with a uh, an affirmation ceremony at our our uh, wedding banquet. Um, can you turn to your exhibit binder, uh, PX 600? Uh, do you recognize that picture? Yes, I do. Uh, what is the picture of? It's a picture um, of uh, one of our family groupings at our, our, our wedding reception, wedding banquet. And this is a picture of, of my mother, my siblings, and some of their children. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to move this into evidence. Very well, 600 is admitted. Um, because marriage later get invalidated. My marriage. The first one. My marriage was not later invalid. My marriage was invalidated about a week before our wedding uh, reception. How did that make you feel? Leah and I felt devastated. We felt sad. We felt we grieved. We felt um, pretty horrible that our. Our marriage that made us so happy and brought us so much joy and made such um, happiness within our families suddenly rendered uh, invalid. And we felt that it wasn't just a statement that our marriages were invalidated. We felt that our relationship was invalidated. We felt that we as human beings had suddenly become invalidated. And we felt pretty awful. Did you and Leah later get married again? We did. When was that? Uh, June of 2008, as soon as that opportunity um, became available. Now, um, Ms. Sia, how has getting married changed things for you? Getting married has made uh, changes in so many multitude of ways, um, tangible and intangible in our lives, that we are even discovering new ways every day. But in the most immediate sense, it, it was in how our families related to us. And so when we first got married in 2004 and had our wedding party, we have, um, we have a niece who was two years old when Leah and I got together. She's my brother's daughter. And she has only known Leah and me as Auntie Helen and Auntie Leah. She has only known us as together, and she was about 15 or 16 when we had the wedding party. And in this exhibit, she's standing here. She came to celebrate with us. And when she got off the plane and came and saw Leah and me, it was the first time she really saw us after after our wedding vows at City Hall. She gave, came over, gave us a big hug, gave Leah a hug, and said, "Auntie Leah, now you're really my auntie." And here. We were, I was a little surprised at, at that 
because I thought, well, you've only known her as your auntie. She's always been your auntie. But then I could see from her little child and teenager point of view that somehow us being officially married made a difference to her and that Leah was now really her auntie. It made a difference to our parents, to how our parents related to us. It made a difference to how we related to people because when you say you're a domestic partner, people, you know, Leah and I spend a lot of time with each other. We go to social engagements with each other. We go to work um, engagements. We're in the world and people say, well, who's this person who seems to be hanging on to you off close? And if I say, oh, she's my partner, I can't count the number of times people say, oh, partner, partner in what business? And Leah and I got used to having to have an answer to that, to say, well, we're partners in life. And then we just get used to watching the look on their faces to see whether they got it, and often it would just be this look of bewilderment. Oh, what business is life? Do you mean life insurance? <laughs> you know, and, um, and for our parents and for our families, you know, marriage is not just about us and our relationship. It's a, it's a matter of how our families also relate to people. You know, for me to show up at every family um, event in Leah's family, every kind of social engagement in her family, people ask, well, who's, who's she? You know, who's this? And for her parents or for her, uh, her 94-year-old auntie to say, well, this is Helen's uh, uh, friend. Uh, this is, well, she must be a really good friend because she's been coming to these uh, events for the last 17 years. She's a really good friend, but friend didn't quite capture it. Partner, they never got. They never said, oh, Helen is Leah's partner. And um, suddenly they were able to say, Helen is my daughter-in-law. My mother, I would watch, my mother is a immigrant from China. English is her second language. She really doesn't get what partner is. I would be around her and her um, her friends who who would look at Leah and I could hear them say, sometimes in English and sometimes in Chinese, who's she? You know, and my mother, before we would marry, would struggle and just say, um, she's Helen's friend. And then it changed and she would say, this is Helen, this is my daughter-in-law. And they would get it. And whether they approved or disapproved, it didn't matter. They got it. It's like you don't insult somebody's wife. You don't insult somebody's mother. She, it's clearly saying, this is my wife. That's it. End of story. There's no questions. Wife and what? Spouses and what? We are not partners in life or in some business. And so it changed things on a, on a, a very huge level like that. And beyond that, I would say marriage and how it affected our families was not just about us and how people related to us. Our families related to each other differently because marriage is, and I'm beginning to understand what I've always read, marriage is the joining of two families. So my family and Leah's family now relate to each other differently. My mother is the in-law to Leah's side of the family. Leah's father became an in-law to my brother who lived about five minutes away from Leah's father while he was still alive. And in those 15 years before we were married that my brother lived near my, uh, my father-in-law, they didn't really make an effort to see each other. After we were married, my father-in-law, Leah's father, actually would stop by my brother's house stop by and drop things off, you know, fruit that was growing in his yard, things like that. My brother is quite active in Hawaii, Leah's, and so please bear with me as I describe the relationship. Leah's brother's wife, my sister-in-law, has a sister who runs in the same circles as my brother, okay? Extended family, they see each other as in-laws now. When they're at a public event, and they will go, and, and my brother will say, this is my in-law. You know, this is Candy. She's related to me. And people will say, how? And then he'll explain. She's, you know, my sister and her sister-in-law are married to each other. 
and then they wait and look to see, you know, whether people understand that. But but the message is they're family. And so our families related differently to each other. Leah's dad had a um, terminal illness. He was in hospice not long ago. He just passed away not even two months ago. When he was in the hospital, in hospice care, Leah and I went to the hospital and were at his side um, quite a lot. And, of course, the other hospital workers, it's like, who, who comes to hospice care? It's the closest immediate family members. They're the ones who are there around the clock. And they would say to Leah's dad, who was not doing well, uh, who, who, who are these? Are these your daughters? And Leah's dad said from his, 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 his hospital bed, this is my daughter, and this is my favorite daughter-in-law. And so it was like, he said, Leah said, he said daughter-in-law. I said, he said favorite. (laughs) But it was a way that even in being so ill, he could describe who we were. And so that was a difference it made. And, And in the important events in life, which I guess if we summarize our lives and we say birth, our lifetime partner creating our own family, and death, when it was time for Leah's dad's funeral, that's when the family comes together. That's when you put out an obituary and you say, who is in the family? When you lay out the, the memorial service hall and you say, who sits here and who sits there? And who has what role? And the members of the immediate family are there in the closest circle. And there was no question that I was Leah's wife and I was a member of the family and there was no ambiguity about it. I wasn't some partner in business or partner in life. I was her spouse and I was right there with the first row in the family and I had my responsibilities as well as being a member of the family. And so in those most important moments in our lives, um, marriage made it very clear that I was a family, that we are family, and where we stand. Thank you, Ms. Hale. I have nothing further. Very well, Mr. Rome, you may cross-examine. Good afternoon, Ms. Ia. I'd like to draw your attention back to uh, the binder that you have there and number PX2198. Do you have it in front of you? Yes, I do. Ms. Ia, do you remember when the first time you saw that document was? It would have been sometime in 2008. I don't remember exactly uh, exactly when I saw it. That um, before the election? Oh, yes, probably. it was before the election. Do you recall where you were when you saw it? I was at home. I'd like to um, draw your attention to the, uh, the document where it begins, Californians have said twice. Do you see that? Yes. Can you read that the entire part? Californians have said twice to keep marriage between one man and one woman. Uh, based on that indication on the document, uh, how did you see it before the election of Prop 8 in um, November of 2008? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Well, the document says Californians have said twice to keep marriage between one man and one woman. One time, uh, they voted in connection with Proposition 22. Do you recall that? Actually, I don't. Do you recall being involved in a case challenging the marriage laws in California? I was, yes. Okay. I'll represent to you that was challenging uh, Proposition 22, which was an initiative where the people of California voted to keep the, mar- the definition of marriage of one man and one woman. 
second time they did that was in connection with Proposition 8. Would you agree with me on that? Well, I am fully aware of Proposition 8. I Would you agree that the people of California voted to, to define marriage as one man and one woman uh, in November of 2008 when they passed Proposition 28? I'm sorry, when they passed Proposition 8? I, I would say people voted uh, for Proposition 8. And this document indicates that the people of California said twice to keep marriage between one man and one woman. Well, I'm not sure that everybody knew what they were voting for, so I'm not sure that they, everybody who voted for Proposition 8 were voting for this. My question is that this document, the one that you're testifying to, indicates on its face that Californians have said twice to keep marriage between one man and one woman. That's what the document says, correct? That is what the document says. And you're testifying that you saw this document prior to the people voting twice. Can you explain that? I'm referring to TX2198. I believe that's the question you're on this item. Oh, council asked about 2199. Nonetheless, all right. I, I've asked it. <laughs> you can pursue the pursue the subject. Well, nonetheless, I've asked her today on the stand whether she's seen this document before. And you testified just a moment ago that you saw this document prior to the election. Isn't that a fact? I said that, but I realized I saw this website before. It's possible that the website changed. I see. You're moving in 2198. No, I'm not, Your Honor. I would like to move on to PX2199. Do you see that, Ms. Zia? Yes. Do you recall when you first saw that document? I saw this website um, at the same time I saw the other one. But this particular document that's been marked as 2199, do you recall when you first saw that document? When you say document, you mean this actual piece of paper? Well, this particular exhibit that's been marked as 2199 that you've testified to here today. That, I'm referring to as a document, just a piece of paper, it's been marked today. When was the first time you saw that? I have seen this on a website prior to, uh, prior to the election in 2008. I've seen this document as something printed out on a piece of paper um, this week. And there's nothing in this document that indicates that it's in support of Proposition 8, is it? Is there? This document is all about the the point of Proposition 8. My, my question is, Ms. Yeah, there's nothing in the document that refers to Proposition 8, isn't that correct? There's nothing on this document that says Proposition 8 on it. And there's nothing in this document that indicates that it was put out by protectmarriage.com, isn't that true? Um, as far as I can tell, there's nothing that says that. And there's nothing in this document that indicates how widely it was distributed. Isn't that a fact? Well, this document was on the internet. This is a copy of something that was on the internet, so it was available to uh, everybody in cyberspace. Nothing that indicates how many people actually viewed it, though. Uh, not on this piece of paper, though. If you went to the website, you could find, you know, page views. I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. And you don't know who actually wrote this document, do you? Um, no, I don't actually know. Your Honor, based on all of that, I would renew our objection to admitting this particular document to evidence. 
Well, the witness said that she saw a posting uh, from this website prior to the election, and I gather her testimony is that the content of this particular posting was one that you believe you saw prior to the November 2008 election. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Very well. 2199 will be admitted. Nazia, you've written materials that have been published that focus on issues addressing matters that are important to the homosexual community. Is that right? Um, I've written on matters related to the gay and lesbian community. That's right. One of the things that you've written about is and advocated for are harsher penalties for crimes motivated by sexual orientation. Uh, harsher penalties for crimes motivated by hatred of around sexual orientation, yes. And you've also advocated for harsher, harsher punishment for crimes motivated by perceived gender and perceived sexual orientation as well. Isn't that right? Yes. Currently a member of the Asian Pacific Islander Equality Organization? Yes, correct? I am. The purpose of that organization is to promote the visibility of Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander, lesbian, gay, bi, and transgendered people. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And prior to November of 2008, prior to the election um, of November of 2008, that organization held a press conference opposing Proposition 8, isn't that right? Yes, that's right. And that organization printed and distributed flyers also opposing Proposition 8, correct? That's correct. And the members of that organization, including you, attended rallies opposing Proposition 8? Yes, that's correct. Now, you're also an advisor for the Horizons Foundation, is that correct? Yes. And that organization grants money to gay, lesbian, bi, and uh, transgender nonprofit organizations. That's correct. And you've attended events put on by Equality California, is that right? Uh, at least one event. You've also attended events put on by the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund? Yes. You also donated money money to uh, Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund. Yes. You've attended events put on by the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Yes. And donated money to the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Yes. You've attended events uh, put on by the Human Rights Campaign. Is that correct? Um, I believe I've attended an, uh, an event that was featured the Human Rights Campaign once. I don't know if it was put on by the Human Rights Campaign. You've attended events uh, put on by the ACLU as well. Is that uh, correct? That's correct. You've also donated money to the ACLU. Yes. Which would make you a member of the ACLU. Uh, yes, but I am not currently a member. I That's lack right. lax in my donation. Are you still your courage campaign in any respect? Are you affiliated with the Courage Campaign in any respect? Uh, I don't know. I don't believe so. Back in 2004, you and your mother submitted sworn declarations on behalf of the City of San Francisco uh, in support of their legal challenge to the California marriage laws that existed at that time. Is that right? Yes. And. Uh, the particular purpose of that uh, litigation was to strike down uh, California's law, which at that time limited marriage to a man and a woman. Is that right? I believe so. Uh, did you write that uh, Asian American queer activists 
do not all agree on what political stand to take towards same-sex marriage? I believe I wrote something like that. And um, in the same article, which is where the queer zone meets the Asian zone, you said, to some gay rights activists, fighting for same-sex marriage is too petty bourgeois, too much about the nuclear family, cocooning, property rights, and all the bad patriarchal things that marriage stands for. You wrote that as well, didn't you not? I believe so. Now, you testified today regarding some of the benefits uh, that you've experienced as a result of being permitted to marry in California, correct? That's right. But you've also written that uh, your civil marriage did not affect your critical view of marriage as a patriarchal institution. Do you recall that? Um, Yes, something to that effect. And you also wrote that one of the reasons why you married Ms. Shigamora was to express your defiance against the warmongering fundamentalist regime in Washington. Did you write that? That sounds like uh, something I wrote. <laughs> You testified today that uh, you first received a marriage license and certificate in February of 2004 when Mayor Newsom began to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples? Yes. And you began to prepare for a uh, marriage celebration and reception uh, after that particular event, is that true? That's right. And you indicated that uh, this particular um, reception took place on August 20th, I believe? Yes. But um, on August, uh, and earlier in August, that particular marriage license and certificate was invalidated by the California Supreme Court. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. But you went forward with the, with the celebration nonetheless, correct? Correct. And the, uh, the celebration was officiated by uh, Ms. Shigamora's father, right? That's right. And uh, her nieces and nephews also attended the ceremony? Her nephew did. She only has one nephew. I see. And your brother and your mother attended? My four brothers and my mother attended, as well as my sisters. And, and five of your siblings gave a toast welcoming Leah into the family at that time, did they not? Yes. And you had a traditional Japanese uh, the bonsai toast? Yes, we did. And you also had uh, a, a Chinese wedding banquet where you had traditional foods that would traditionally be served at a wedding, correct? Oh, yes. And you stated that um, this particular wedding party that you had, uh, even though it wasn't officially recognized by the state, your wedding was not at that time, uh, brought about the melding of your and uh, Ms. Shigamora's extended family and friends, correct? Yes. In fact, in Where the Queer Zone Meets the Asian Zone, you stated, quote, it was a wedding party that far exceeded our wildest imaginations. It seemed to serve another purpose, too, the melding of our extended family and friends. Our respective families, already so supportive of us, suddenly transform their relationships to each other to reflect a more intimate relative status. So the fact is, even though your particular uh, marriage certificate that you received from Mayor Newsom was invalidated, that celebration still served the very purpose that uh, you stated uh, in this quote I just read. Is that correct? Well, our families saw us as married, but there was a cloud over it. One week earlier, we had learned in the news, it was national news, that our marriage 
was no longer really a marriage anymore. And so we went ahead with our party, but everybody there knew that, you know, it had been invalidated as well. And in fact, Leah's father, Judge Shigemura, um, said in his, in his um, uh, affirmation um, vows for us to repeat, that he recognized that, but that um, he said courts sometimes make mistakes, and he said that as a retired judge. And so within the whole ceremony, there was definitely a recognition, uh, uh, the ceremony and the celebration, there was a recognition that there was a, a bittersweet element to it as well. But none of that kept you from saying that it was a wedding party that far exceeded your wildest imagination. Yes, right. That's right. And may I just also say... Well, if you would like, uh, your attorney can simply ask you questions to help you elaborate if you'd like. Okay. If you say this, if he likes. And you stated, quote, that uh, the wedding ceremony and banquet represented the union of your and Mr. Morris' family. Is that correct? Yes, symbolically it did. I don't have any further questions, John. Very well, any redirect, Mr. June? Just a few questions, Ms. Sia. Um, when Mr. Rahm interrupted you, you're going to continue saying something. Do you want to finish? Yes. Um, I'd like to say, in talking about the fact that our families came together, even though our uh, marriage had been invalidated, it was really the difference, night and day, between being domestic partners and being married. Um, even symbolically married, even though it had been overturned. It was as though we had tasted um, that we had been prisoners in a closet, that we had been deprived of something, that we had been told to sit in the back of the bus and accept this kind of lesser status of domestic partners. And suddenly, within those four months, uh, four months, February to, to August, six months, between the time we were married to the time that we had, uh, our marriage was invalidated, that we had a taste of that we were married, and that during that six months, our families really had a transformational moment that tr uh, that I think did transcend the 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 sadness that we felt. But it didn't take away from the loss. I mean, we still recognize we lost something very important. Um, but in terms of their relating to each other, it was quite a different way from when we had domestic partnership. You know, the, the idea that we would be families, that we, for a brief moment in time, we experienced a feeling of, of, of what um, equality is, what, um, instead of having to go to the fountain that is just for gay and lesbian people here. We could go to the fountain that formerly said uh, heterosexuals only, and we tasted the water that was sweeter there, and our family experienced that. And so, yes, the, um, uh, our, at the time of our wedding celebration, our marriages were legally invalidated, but we had already begun a process of our families coming together in a way that did not happen in the prior 11 years that we had been domestic partners. Further, Your Honor. Very well, Ms. Sia. Thank you for your testimony. You may step down. But I believe that should conclude our testimony today, Council, and we're on the eve of the three-day weekend, which I trust you all will enjoy. Are there any matters that we want to or need to take up before we adjourn? Mr. Boutrous? Mr. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, one thing, I may be ill-advised in the premises, but I think the court's ECF system may be going down for the weekend, it, and uh, your, your deputy is indicating yes. I, we just didn't know if the court would like us
to send, uh, obviously we'll serve any filings that may come up over the weekend via email on plaintiffs, but is there an email address for the court that we should uh, copy to keep can, the... Can you hand deliver uh, things? Let me, let me ask the clerk how we're going to deal with this. Email will also be down. Well, I would suggest you spend a restful weekend, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Very submitted. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Anything further? Very well. 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning, Council.